Welcome to An Apple a Day, a podcast, a resource, a community. Share your experiences and learn from others as we overcome barriers and learn to live a happy, healthy life with a disability. Welcome to the community. Here's your host, Jimmy Apple. Welcome to another episode of An Apple a Day. I'm your host, Jimmy Apple. How you feeling today, my friends? You feeling good? You feeling strong? You feeling better than you did yesterday? Excellent. You can't ask for better than that. How are you making out with your doctor's appointments? Are you keeping your appointments? Are you going to them? Are you going to them on time? Are you doing what the doctor's telling you to do? That's the best you can do. Hey, I want to remind you, an Apple a Day is brought to you by www.famousapple.com. Famousapple.com is the home site for this podcast, so if you get a minute, check it out. While you're tripping around the web, make sure you stop by our group page, Living with a Disability. That You can find that over on Facebook. You can go to www.famousapple.com forward slash group. It'll bring you right to the page. There's people over there chatting, they're talking, they're making friends, they're answering questions, asking questions. You name it, they're doing it. You should join in and do it too. So go to www.famousapple.com forward slash group and join in on the conversations. Check them out. We have got a good one for you today. How many people remember Lynn Bowman? Go ahead. You remember Lynn? Raise your hand. Hey, she is the grandma that was baking brownies. And she was giving them to you for breakfast. Brownies for breakfast. She wrote a book, Brownies for Breakfast. Brownies that were actually good for you. Now, she was on last month, and I went out and I got the book. And I actually, my wife, actually, not me, I don't cook. My wife tried the recipes, and I, well, she cooked the recipes, all right? I tried them. (laughs) And let me tell you something. These brownies are really good. And there's a lot of other recipes in the book, and we're going to discuss that today. But you have to try these recipes. There's one recipe in particular for soup that has a kick to it. We're going to discuss that today. The thing is, if you try the soup, you shouldn't drive for a few hours after the soup. (laughs) We'll discuss that too. But if you don't remember who Lynn is, or you need a reminder... Dave's going to give that to us right now. So sit back for a second and listen to what Dave has to say. This is just to remind you who Lynn Bowman is. Don't eat crap. That's still her battle cry. There is enormous power in resetting your relationship with food, taking control of your health, strength, mindset, and mood. But why take cooking or health advice from a snarky grandma who doesn't own a restaurant, isn't a reality TV star, doesn't have a medical degree, and doesn't particularly like to cook? Here's why. Her new book, Brownies for Breakfast, a cookbook for diabetics and the people who love them, is a cool, fun, beautiful, guidebook for anybody who wants to eat healthy, vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, gluten-free and sugar-free. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes more than 30 years ago, and offers herself as living proof that you can cook, eat, sleep and walk your way out of type 2 diabetes, along with other chronic ailments. That's what she wants for you, and the people who love you. Brownies for Breakfast tells you exactly how to do it. And now, back to Jimmy. Thanks, Dave. Now, let me assure you, (laughs) this conversation is not going to be just about cooking and cookbooks. We did that last time. This conversation takes on a lot more. Lynn has become a good friend of the podcast. She's become a good friend of mine. And we discuss a whole myriad of subjects. We discuss everything from (laughs) what's going on in the world today, to video games, to kids, you name it, we discuss it. We also discuss the book. There's no getting around that because the book is a good book. I bought it and I had to discuss a couple of things with her because I was expecting a cookbook that's like a recipe, a recipe, a recipe. This, it's not really a cookbook. Well, it is a cookbook, but it's not, well. We're going to discuss that in the in the in the conversation here with Lynn. But Lynn is a very fun person, 
And this is a very fun interview, so you're going to really want to listen to it. You're going to enjoy it. Trust me. So sit back, relax, buckle up for a fun interview with Lynn Bowman. So, I once again, I have with us today Lynn Bowman. Now, some of you might be saying, Lynn Bowman, I know that name from somewhere. Well, if you're a regular listener, which you should be, <laughs> she, she's been with us before. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you, do you remember we spoke about brownies for breakfast? Uh, it's coming back to you. It's coming back to you. You're thinking, brownies for breakfast, that sounds like a good idea. It is. <laughs> it's a very good idea. And this is the lady who's going to tell you, once again, how to make those brownies for breakfast without having to unbutton your pajama pants. How you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> how you doing today, Lynn? I, you know, talking to you, Jimmy, I'm doing great, and, uh, and thank you so much for having me back. Well, thank you for coming back. You're reminding me that really what I talk about a lot is being naughty, but nice, right? Uh, exactly, um, exactly. And I'm a believer. I mean, you know, we should be able to be naughty in a wonderful, delicious way that doesn't also wreck our health. Exactly. That's a, that's a great thing. Yeah. So, yes, brownies for breakfast. Great idea for everybody. And, wait. and lunch, too. And dinner. Well, <laughs> you know, all day. No, forget, forget lunch and dinner, because for lunch and dinner, we're having soup, and there's a special <laughs> ingredient in soup that <laughs> you're not going to want to go out after the soup. Trust me. Or you could have brownies with the soup. <laughs> well, now there is a meal. Definitely a meal. A and meal? What, um, yes. What what you're hearing here, for anybody who didn't get the recipe online last time, is there's a, a mushroom soup in the book that very simple. Anybody can make it, inexpensive. Hardly, it's just got mushrooms, onions, broth. You cook it in a regular pan on top of the stove. Easy peasy. But, and then you put it in the blender and then right before you serve it, you put in a, let's call it a dash of whiskey. And, <laughs> it, and I don't want you to use your good stuff. Okay, a blop. That's another measurement I use a lot, a blop of whiskey. You don't use your good stuff in the soup. You don't need to. Save your good stuff. Just put the inexpensive stuff that your brother-in-law gave you, that you've got in the cupboard. Put a little bit of it in the mushroom soup, stir it around. And it, as they say on the cooking shows, it elevates <laughs> the, the soup substantially. And it will also elevate your mood just to know it's in there. But it really is a great taste addition to what could be a sort of semi-ordinary soup. It's yummy. And it's also just slightly naughty. So, hey, it's, it's good, isn't it? It's what I call the magic mushroom. <laughs> magic, there you go. Magic okay, mushroom Okay, there's another great soup. How to make your mushroom soup magic. There, there you go. go. That's a and good headline for next time. And next mm -hmm. <laughs> and after you have lunch with the with the brownies and, and the magic mushroom soup, you just have yes. to take a little nap. <laughs> yes, you do. And of course, um, as I like to say, these are definitely they can be California brownies if you get my drift. <laughs> if you prefer. <laughs> Um, it's legal. But, it's legal now in California. <laughs> well, well it's, it, it's legal in New York now too. Right, and where I live, <clears throat> we have we are a an agricultural area. Let's say <clears throat> in Northern California. So when you walk out in my front yard and take a deep whiff, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's more than you bargained for. And it's kind of like, whoa, okay. It gives um, people a reason to jog in the morning. <laughs> that's right. We do have a lot of joggers. I what do you think? Uh, <laughs> they run into walls. Right. <laughs> no, no. 
<laughs> no. And and I love that we're talking to each other from opposite coasts. This really. is true. This yeah. Is... Um, across the miles, Jimmy. Really. Yeah. Okay, as the eagle flies. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. But... And w- we don't know what that eagle is doing up there. And we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, food should be fun. Uh, and even if we are trying hard to be healthy and we're trying really hard to extend our life or make ourselves more active or whatever it is that we're trying to do, eat good food, whole food, mostly plant-based, um, and make it fun and beautiful. That's what I'm all about. That's right. It's not hard. It's not hard. Uh, you know, it just, it's, we're all so lazy now about our food, aren't we? Well, you know, the whole thing is, is it makes things easier if you take it from the light side of things. If you're having fun doing it, 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 it makes it less hard. You know, people, when people start thinking about eating healthy and they always think of the first thing that I know I always thought of was all right I'm gonna have to eat a salad or I'm gonna have to <laughs> <laughs> punishment worse than death right, right? it's a like ah. you know you're used to eating good stuff like you know junk but you start reading the recipes that are in your book brownies for breakfast and it's good stuff I I yes. I ate the brownies. I got to tell you this. I was telling Lynn before we started. I got the book and read it cover to cover. And it reads, it doesn't read like a cookbook because there's stories in between. And we're going to get to that. But it it reads, it, there's, there's recipes in this cookbook. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, you have to dig for them. <laughs> you have to, yeah, it's kind of like you have to look for them. But I, 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 Not ate, really, but. I ate the brownies. And they weren't California brownies. They were, <laughs> they were regular edible brownies. <laughs> and the one thing I found about them was, number one, if you compared them to store-bought brownies and you had a blind taste test, you would definitely pick the ones from the book. And I'm telling you this as a guy that likes to eat. And as I, t- <laughs> as I told Lynn, these brownies are enough to make a fat man sin. Because, because they're that good. But the one thing I found about them is you eat one and you're going, oh, they're, they're really good, but wow, I'm kind of, you know, they're filling. But you go to eat the yeah. second one and you're like, I'm kind of full. Where if I was uh, eating just from the from the, the bakery, say, I could probably knock off two or three without even blinking an eye and maybe go for a fourth. But this here... <laughs> I did two, and two getting through the second one was kind of doubtful because I was I was actually full. And what you're talking about, Jimmy, is something that is so important to our health that people don't entirely understand until we really put it on the table. And that is that most of the food that we're eating now is not cooked. It's not grandma food. It is engineered food. It's food that is actually engineered so you can't stop eating it and it's engineered for roi and for shareholder value the, there are people getting very very wealthy on you getting sick there are people who i mean the whole idea that they're interested in any way in your health is crazy they're interested in making money and the way to make money is to get you to eat more crap to eat more of that food that's not really food, to eat more food that really is not nutritious at all. And so we're hooked, you know, we're, we're, it, it's, it is absolutely, absolutely, um, it's, it's what? It's, mm, it's heroin <laughs> in the form of cookies and brownies. And in fact, it's more addictive than heroin. It, there's a lot of science behind it. So, and, and I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, I'm imagining, because we, by now, most of us understand that there is sugar in everything we eat that, that is in a bag or a box. Almost everything has sugar in it and, or tons of salt and tons of not healthy fats. That's what I was just going to say, salt. Yeah. Salt is the 
tons of salt. And people f- ask me a lot, well, you know, you, you have salt in your recipes. Yes, I do. Because if you're not eating factory-made food, if you're not eating over-processed, packaged food, you can salt stuff. You can put a little salt. Now, if, you're, if your doc has said, no salt for you, okay, don't listen to me. But if you're just wanting a normal amount of salt in your diet, not too much, no worries. Where you get that salt is at KFC or in a bag of Oreos or you know, virtually anything else that comes in a bag or a box. If you look at the ingredients and look at how much salt and sugar, of course, is in it, it's a head slapper. You know, how can they get that much salt in sweets? <laughs> right? um, how can they get that much salt? in something well, without it tasting salty but have you ever looked at a frozen dinner how much it's salt? Been a while <laughs> no, i'm just saying how much salt is in a prepared dinner or prepared prepared food in the frozen right. aisle how much right. sodium is in that my right. god you, you you look at that and you have to wonder all right there's this much sodium where is the food what's in this yes. what's in this package Yes, and of course, it, you know, the more the, the front of the box says healthy, you know, oh, nutritious, does. whatever, then you know you've got a problem. Well, look at, uh, I don't want to mention names, but there's a thing called cuisine, and it has a mm-hmm. name before it. Look at the mm-hmm. amount of sodium that's in that. My right. God, I don't know what's lean about it. it <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you don't mean queen cuisine, do you? No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, um, it's great. Once you start really, really, and I and I suggest that, and you know because you read the book, that I talk about label reading yes. up front. It's the most important thing that you do about what you eat is read the label of anything that you're eating. And if it's got more than two or three ingredients, right away you're like, "Uh oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a problem." Well, um, the, the fewer ingredients it has, the the better your chances are that it's an okay thing to eat. Well, the other thing is too, and now, is people out people are out working during the day and they run out for a quick lunch, and they, oh, I'll just grab a sandwich. Whoa, yeah. cold cuts. Yeah. The amount yeah. of sodium that's in cold cuts. Yes, and worse than that, a thing that is sort of a dirty secret is that it is it is absolutely science based. There's a ton of research behind the fact that cold cuts are cancer causing. Well, there there, were... there's no question about it. The the nitrates, the stuff that is in pepperoni and and salami and bologna and all those things, uh, they cause cancer. So, yeah. uh, it, you know that that's where I stop. That, well, <laughs> okay, okay, they're yeah, d- enough. They're also um, jam packed with MSG. The... They have so much cruddy stuff in them. And not only that, but it's the worst meat from the worst places that gets turned into that kind of product. If it were good meat, they'd sell it as meat. But anything, and you know, we've talked about this before, and I go on and on about factory farmed meat. I am not a vegan, strictly. I'm plant-based, which means simply that most everything that I eat is from plants. I do eat eggs. And I and their eggs are good food, and and the the hens are happy to see me take them. Uh, but you you need to know the hen, and you need to know where the eggs come from. And the eggs that you buy on the cheapest shelf at Safeway are not good eggs. You need pasture raised, you know, healthy eggs. I do eat occasionally some pasture raised, grass fed beef because my neighbors raise it and i literally know the names of the animal the, the people who are raising the animals and the you know I, I i drive by them on my way to town which is only two miles by the way mm-hmm. and that's different it's different once you don't know the source of your meat then you, it gets very very dicey and it's not just because of what it's doing to your body. It's what it's because of what it's doing to the dirt, the earth, the community, the air. 
factory farming of animals is not your friend. It's not good for the animals or you or anybody. I would invite anyone who who wants to eat healthy and wants to eat meat, okay, it can be done, but you need to source that meat and not eat it all day, every day. Most Americans eat meat two or three times or more a day, every day, which I'm sorry, that's not good for you. It's just not. Well, for a number of reasons. Everything, everything should be eaten in moderation. Except greens, Jimmy, dark greens. You can just eat as much spinach as you want, honey, and it is not going to hurt you one bit. Well, <laughs> you can eat as much chard or cabbage or collard greens or celery as you want. Well, and I defy you to be able to eat so much that you just can't eat anymore. Well, I had that problem. I used to eat spinach all day. You didn't. I, you I did. Really I, did? I, I, I used to eat it all day, and it got what? me it got me sick. I was you're the first person I have ever met in my life who well, spinach it, all day. I, I used to eat it breakfast, lunch and dinner. And Because you like it? Because n- what? no, because I used to watch Popeye and I thought it would build muscles. And I used to oh, go that's out and, hilarious. I used to go out and pick fights. I got my ass kicked every day. <laughs> For eating spinach? Yeah, because I thought I could fight with anybody. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So I went to eat. That's hilarious. I went to eat olives after that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for anyone listening, don't eat spinach three times a day. I'm Two gonna, times uh, a day is okay. I'm only kidding. Three. Never built my okay. muscles though. I smoked a pipe. <laughs> that didn't build muscle either. Didn't right? build a muscle either. I, <laughs> I couldn't run. And, f- and I have a question for you. Why don't well, men, particularly, why doesn't anybody smoke a pipe anymore? Whatever happened to pipes? Did you ever smoke a pipe? I tr- um, no. I no. tried. I tried. Don't ask me about cigars, okay? I, <laughs> I tried smoking a pipe. How was it? It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's why people don't do it anymore. It was, if you look at any of the old movies, movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s, the manly men were always uh, the manly men who wore jackets. Right, were always smoking a pipe. Hey, let me tell Did you. you Notice that. I I I went through this phase because I I I started smoking cigarettes, and then I yeah. I figured cigarettes are bad for you. So then I went to a, I went to cigars, and mm-hmm. I just smelled like an army blanket. <laughs> <laughs> then I from said, a bad army. yeah, <laughs> from an army that lost. And then uh-huh. <laughs> then. A loser. Yeah, yeah. And then I said, well, I like the way pipes smelled but when I smelled other people smoking them. So I went to a pipe. And I thought I was very cool. <laughs> here, here I am. A, did you wear, did you have a tweed jacket that uh, you wore? I had a suit jacket that I wore. And uh-huh. I'm smoking a pipe. And I always seen people put the pipe in that top pocket of the jacket. Uh-huh. I'm all, I almost set myself on fire. I was going to say, I know where this is going. <laughs> I almost set myself on fire. <laughs> I never realized that they emptied the pipe before they put it in their pocket. <laughs> there was no manual that came with the pipe. Obviously. No, there wasn't. They, no one ever said, don't put a lit pipe in your pocket, so I did. <laughs> I wasn't the brightest teenager that there was. I went back to, well, I went back to cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It was... Well, it was easy to roll the pack in your sleeve. It looked cooler than the pipe in my pocket burning me up. Well, uh, you know, the lucky strikes in your T-shirt sleeve. Yeah, uh, that was a thing. Lucky strikes, camels, uh-huh, uh-huh, Paul uh-huh. Mall. I have to tell yep. you one thing real quick. <laughs> We're on cigarettes. If you ever looked at a pack of cigarettes, a pack of Paul Mall cigarettes, non-filter, on the front of the pack, it says where... Wherever particular people congregate, congregate, right? That's what it says on the mm-hmm. front of a pack of Paul Mall cigarettes. Funny okay. thing about Paul Mall cigarettes, back in the day, those were the only cigarettes they sold in prison. So wherever, <laughs> <laughs> wherever particular people congregate, those are the only cigarettes they sold in prison. Paul Mall. Oh, that's hilarious. That's a, that's that's a, hilarious. There's a fact for trivial, trivial pursuit for you. <laughs> well, and, you know, it, it tickles me, Jimmy, to hear people kind of 
waxing poetic about how great things were back in the day. You know, people who kind of romanticized the 50s and 60s as being this great time to grow up and so on. And one of my memories that it's kind of it's a smell memory, as long as we're talking about that. My mother and her pals would sit in the kitchen at the turquoise formica table. <laughs> and did you have a table like that? Yes, I think uh, everybody, yeah. everybody yeah, did. Yeah, a chrome and turquoise yep. formica table. And they would smoke their Pall Malls and drink their Manhattans mm -hmm. and play cards all afternoon. And, of course, just dish, gossip like crazy. Yep. Um and it, we lived in a neighborhood where everybody was kind of in the same kind of house and they were post post war houses and so on. But think about what happened to all those people <laughs> after years of drinking Manhattans and smoking cigarettes all afternoon and playing cards. Of course, for kids, it was great because we left the house. They didn't know, didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> We just wandered, feral, all afternoon, having a great time, breaking our teeth and climbing trees and, you know, getting dumped off of scooters or horses or whatever. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah, in a way, it was a great time to grow up because our parents were smoking Pall Malls and drinking Manhattans all afternoon. Yep. And when we would go to the beach on vacation, what did they do? <laughs> we would be in the water, right, on our inner tubes for eight hours straight. And the parents would be up on the beach, smoking, <laughs> smoking pummels, pummels. <laughs> drinking Manhattan's, <laughs> playing canasta, right? Uh, and and we were fine <laughs> without <laughs> any supervision whatsoever. And now we've gone the opposite direction. I right? know. And the poor kids can't even take a poop without mom and dad standing over them making sure that it's correctly proportioned and you know <laughs> made of the right stuff and that yes. it will add to their resume in some way so they can get in the right college i know um it's it's it's, it's sad actually <laughs> i feel bad for well, the kids so, i kind of do too they're not and, having a uh, childhood anymore not so much no yeah and of course none of us understand really what social media is doing to our brains and their brains except you and me right. we're okay with this stuff right we love it <laughs> <laughs> we're having a great time we think it's good exactly. yeah it's yeah. good for us yeah. <laughs> it's good for, good for people yeah. it's good for kids our age yes yes and heaven knows it's more fun to be a kid at our age than it is to be a kid when you're eight Exactly. Exactly. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be an eight-year-old. <laughs> oh, I have aspired to that, and I finally, I now have my hair cut like a nine-year-old boy, and I like it. There you um, go. Yeah, because women spend so much of their lives on their hair, Jim. Did you ever stop and think about that? Please. I live it. I... <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with I grew up with, with four sisters. Oh, uh, so you had it up close and personal, honey. You and saw it happening. I have a wife and a daughter, so okay. <laughs> I rest my case. And there you uh, go. Yeah. And me, I'm going bald. <laughs> well, but see, men always had it figured out. It's just you know, don't waste your time on grooming or your hair or any of that stuff. Just go for making the money all the time basically and terrorizing people That's oh, no. <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> okay i s i spent all my time on a motorcycle well there's that yeah yeah it, either under cars or in the case of my husband um with his beloved airplanes and gliders um, oh your husband your husband is a, is a pilot well in his quote spare time <laughs> <laughs> and every woman listening to this goes okay i understand <laughs> what spare time is right he um, he flies gliders um, he flies gliders and um and i'm laughing about it but it's uh, it, 
it is a spectacular and interesting and fun and beautiful thing. He's one of those guys. I and and I can't pick on him, Jimmy, because of it being dangerous or this or that. Because I'm a horsewoman, so I. <laughs> yeah. like, anybody wants to point a finger at somebody for having a stupid, expensive, dangerous hobby? That's me. Yeah, yeah. but sorry, a, a glider. That's that's tantamount of skydiving. How do you go up in a yes. plane that has no motor? Well, you have to kind of know something about thermals. You have to know some stuff. And and it's it's a fairly religious experience to be up there flying around just on the air. It's well, beautiful. I, I could understand that because if that was me yeah. and the plane released me up in the air, yeah. the whole time I'm up there, I'd be going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, religious. Religious? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Exactly. But it's, it's uh, of course, it's all weather dependent and everything, and you have to have the right tow pilot. And, yeah, rah, rah. and so it's it's not like you can just go out in your front yard and do this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's interesting. He also has, um, a, and I love this, he has an airplane that is exactly the same age as I am, only he gets to call his airplane antique. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 1946 Piper Cub. Well, and, my uh, my uncle had it, my uncle had oh uh, had a Piper Cub. That was the first plane yes. I ever floated flew to float flew in. <laughs> yeah, they're they're a very sweet American simple tradition in flying. You know, it's just kind of some canvas and a few sticks and a. <laughs> a, a little motor kind of like a, a lawnmower a lawnmower <laughs> right. and, and but flying with him in that is i is such a joy for me because it's the windows are open you know it's just you and the air and you fly low and slow so you actually get to see everything down below and it's brilliant i i love it it's really sweet oh. but here's another thing that's changing because of the whole, you know, sort of uh, climate change thing and going away from gasoline. Our lives are going to change a lot when we lose the internal combustion engine, which we must lose. But I want somebody to electrify Piper Cubs so that we can still fly them. I hope somebody does. Would, sure you, would you honestly get into a plane with an electric motor? Yeah, with my husband, you bet. Oh, I'm sure with your husband, but I mean, you would tr- I wouldn't trust a car on a long drive with an electric motor because it's interesting to hear you say that. Because you've think, never been by the side of the road in a gas engine. I have. I have, but think about yeah. this. Think about this. A battery-operated car doesn't create electricity. It only stores electricity to the battery. Uh huh. You have to create electricity from somewhere. And that okay, t- but a gas engine doesn't create gas either. No, it doesn't. No. So y- y- it's kind of like a moot point. This, this you're still creating, you're still creating electricity using coal. You're still creating electricity using. Uh, Not in California, honey. No, you're going to import it from somewhere else. <laughs> no, we have wind and solar. And we're talking about some other interesting things here, uh, and this is a this is an area in which I have no expertise. But, but I will just say that I so love engines, and this is where we're getting back to our sort of man versus woman thing. I love engines that aren't noisy. I love quiet engines, and it's kind of cute because men struggle with that. They like, you know, did you ever notice, Jim? that you'll hear a frog outside sometimes. You know, mm-hmm. It'll be like a bullfrog, this giant, loud frog. And you'll go outside, probably nine years old again, and find the frog. And the frog is actually an inch long and really green. And he's making all this noise. I think men love making noise. Don't you? It has to do, has to do with finding girls, I think. That's in, my, in my younger days, I used to love making noise. Yeah. As, I, as I got older... I took the California pipes off my motorcycle and I put the glass pack pipes on. <laughs> <laughs> I I used to get a headache. <laughs> well, 
I just I love the quiet of electric vehicles. I think, that, I, I think that bit is wonderful. But I have to tell you also that I just went up to the city th- this last weekend with my older daughter who drives a Tesla. Oh, really? And, yeah, and um, I haven't driven her car, but I was in the back seat with my granddaughter, and my daughter and her friend wanted to go off and do a thing. So she said, okay, you guys, just we'll wait in the car. Okay, we'll wait in the car. They walked off. This smarty pants car decided to roll the windows up and turn on the air conditioning oh, yeah. itself. But see, okay. the thing with that Wrong. is, go ahead. That's just that's crazy. Yeah, but, stop it. But the thing with that is, it's using its power to do that. I had a nurse that was coming to the house for me after I came out of the hospital and had a Tesla, and it, he was very. Him and I got it. We got to be very friendly, and he showed me this car, and he was very impressed with the fact that he could make the car go up the driveway by himself, by itself. Oh, God. And it was, you know, and it was cool. It really was, but what was the sense of that, that it could do that, (laughs) (laughs) except the fact that it was cool? And he says, well, I can make it come to me if I'm at at the shopping center, if he's at ShopRite, and I was like, so... You can call the car to come to you. Why don't you just walk to the car? Yeah. And he says, well, it's just the thing that it can do. And I was like, that's cool. And he says, I can make it open the trunk from here. And I said, that's, that's, okay, that's cool. And he says, uh, I can make it open the doors or close the doors and make sure it's locked. And we were going on and on about everything that this car can do. But the biggest thing that he was thrilled about showing me was the fact that and I have a very long driveway. It's probably about 400 feet long. That he can make it maneuver. And my driveway is a little bit windy. It was, the house is brand new. So, you know, it's just decorative, really. And he can make it, and he c- controls it all with his phone. And he's the only downside to it is it uses up his, you know, his. His phone. <laughs> well, his phone and his car battery. It. You know, oh, okay. The, his, I said, so why do you do it? He says, because I can. Okay. I don't know about you, Jim, but I don't like appliances that think they're smarter than I am. No, neither do I. It, it, Even if they're right, I don't want them. Exactly. <laughs> I don't like them. I, it makes me nervous. No. Yeah. <laughs> and well, he's, oh, I like to make the decisions about whether you go on or off or whether you roll the window down or up. I like to make those decisions about whether the air conditioner comes on or off. Well, that, I like it left up to me. Thank you very much. Well, that was the other thing. He's sitting in, he's sitting in my dining room, and he says he can s- start the air conditioner or the heater before he even goes out, or the defroster on the window, or this. Uh, I mm-hmm. said, do you got you know, an $85,000 car sitting in my driveway? You're going to worry about setting the defroster before you go out in the morning? If I had an $85,000 car, it would be in a garage. (laughs) But there you go. (laughs) And why doesn't somebody come up with a way to cook with all that? I mean, if somebody had invented a way that you could suddenly get a fabulous home-cooked meal, you know, through some sort of app, (laughs) okay. And I don't mean delivered from a restaurant. No, in your house. about food. Right, in your house. Because even if you're eating in good restaurants, you're not, for the most part, getting healthy food. Because they're trying hard to make food that everybody will want more of. So, well, yeah. Of course. Well, Back they, to that. They, they was, there was something in the news yesterday that stores in New York here, they, they can't find people to work in the, in the grocery stores. So now they have uh, robots that can stock shelves. Oh, oh God, yeah. Well, and that's a whole other subject because we this is happening mm-hmm. while we're not really aware of it. How much stuff is getting automated every day that we never imagined would be automated. But it's right in front of our noses. You know, it's just becoming sort of normal. And every one of those things that becomes automated means that that's a thing that people won't do anymore. So well, what will those people then do? They're, they're going to sit back. And they're going to get fat, honestly. No. That, no. That's what's going to happen. We're becoming, we're, we're putting ourselves out. And then we're going to be crying later on going, well, they took our jobs. Right. And look, look what's become of us. 
Right. People become people become lazy, and that again, this all we're talking all this stuff, and this all goes back to your book where people. I, how do you explain it? People end up becoming fat and lazy. Well, and actually, I may be disagreeing with you here. I'm not sure, but what I've found in my life is that most people love nothing more than to do good, productive work that they believe in. When people are doing a craft, let's say, that they're really good at, the, the, and I'm looking around my room as I talk, and the, the guys who helped me build this room that I'm in are so good at what they do, and they like what they do, and they're happy, and they, they love working with people who appreciate them, and so on and so forth. People love to work. I loved to work when I worked. I enjoyed it. In fact, I quit UCLA and left, and this was not a thing that, you know, was um, considered smart in the day. Uh, I left after three semesters, took off uh, to go to work. I wanted to work. I didn't want to pay somebody else to read my stuff. I wanted somebody to pay me to read right. my stuff. And And working is a joy. Being productive is a joy. So people don't want to not do anything, I don't think, for the most part. I mean, we all want to be able to sit on the beach and do some of those things as well, but most of us seek out work that is meaningful and and that we think may help people and that we think amounts to something that matters. It's hard to feel that way about stocking shelves and doing certain other things. And so in a way you think, well, okay, maybe automation is a good thing because it's pointing people at doing something more creative or more fun or more interesting. I don't know. It, it, we don't know how it's going to turn out. If that was the case in every situation, I'd say you're 100% right. Do what you want. Do what you what you feel. What, what your passion is, do it. But mm-hmm. that's not the case in every case. No, that's, that's true. You know, and right. you, you get people that they think stocking shelves is below them or... Sweeping streets is below them. For me, I was always taught an honest day's work is an honest day's work. Whatever yeah. it is. And I believe me when I tell you, I've done I've done just about everything from <laughs> cleaning up parks to selling food in, in beaches. Right. To driving a truck. I was a I was a truck driver. I went to college. I, I became a, a manager. You know, I worked. I, I I've done. I think I've done it all. To be honest with you, I I worked in a tire shop. I was an auto mechanic. I I there washed cars. Whatever it was, and proudly, proudly, I can say this: never once in my life did I ever collect unemployment. Never once. I never quit a job without having another job. And. And, but here's a, here's a truth too, Jimmy, because I I grew up in the same sort of era that you're talking about, where there mm-hmm. was always work. There was always work to be done. Well, you could always get something. Yeah, but it um, was you can always get something. It may not be what you want. Right, but you could get something. And for sure, I, you know, you always work towards what you wanted. I wanted to go back to college. I love I I left high school. And I didn't want to go to I didn't want to go to college when I left high school, and I ended up driving a truck. I wanted to be a truck driver. My father was a truck driver. I wanted to be a truck driver, but then you know I found out you can't be a truck driver and really have a home life. But right, and I I was a truck driver. But the company that I worked for liked me, and they offered to send me back to school. And I I jumped at the opportunity, and that's how I ended up in management and then upper management, and that's how I ended up getting hit by a truck. <laughs> and well, that part's not good. But but that's but how I met I you. I'm here. Saying, yeah. Well, that part's good. Right. right there. Yeah, that's good. But it's not what you do; it's how you do it. Uh, and uh, you know, I can say I had a million different kinds of jobs, but I always tried hard to do whatever was put in front of me to do. And I failed at a lot of it. (laughs) I wasn't always good. But I I said yes 
and I dove in and I tried and um, and I never expected to not work. Right. You know, I I it, I liked to work. I looked forward to working. Okay. Exactly. But uh, and and I was bored stiff at UCLA. I found it very boring. Right. It's that's I found school very boring myself. Yeah. And that's so why I didn't are. want to go on. But then we later were, on, we in were life, the bad kids, Jim. We yeah. Exactly. Kids. Exactly. We sat in the back of the class. <laughs> that's right. But you know, spitballs. Exactly. <laughs> but that's what I say now. You know, there's jobs to be had. Like the kids today, kids today don't want to start at the bottom and work their way up. They want to start at the top and make big money. They want to be rap stars, rock stars. They want to, they want to have the gold. They want to have the the bling, as they say. But no one wants to start at the bottom. So now you're putting robots in to do jobs that, as kids, we would have jumped well, at it. And I won't agree with you on kids today because I, I got I got grandkids and I have a lot of friends that are kids and they are like we were. They're they're eager to go out in the world and see how things really work. Well, God the bless difference, them. The difference is social media. You know, the difference is the media that kids are consuming now is not the same as it was. I mean, and, and we were consuming crappy media too, but. Not to the degree that kids are now. I mean, they're just bombarded. Of course. With all this stuff, a huge part of which is just complete. I mean, how do I say it? It's so garbagey. Um, and so I think that, that kids who are consuming all that stuff have a slightly different attitude about well, they work, s- hard work, whatever. Right. Well, they see, uh, they see, the, I mean, we had three channels on TV. Exactly. They've, right. they've got 2,003 channels. And right. they're looking at shows yeah. that kids are telling the parents what to do. And kids are living the dream. They're, they're driving cars at 16 that are worth more than the houses that we lived in. Right. You know. All that. And they're not stocking shelves. They're, they're, they're record moguls at, you know. At sixteen, they're they're up on stage. They make it, you know. That's what I'm saying. They're not stocking shelves. They're not working well, at McDonald's. They're not. You know what I don't see enough of that I see a little bit of, and I'm always so happy when I see it is kids working with their parents. Yep. Where where whether it's in a restaurant, out in the fields, you know, doing construction, yep, truck driving, whatever it is. When kids can be included in parents' professional lives in whatever way. And I know in my own life, because I had my own company, it was a creative services company, and I ran it basically out of my house because I had three kids, and I you know, didn't have an option there. Really. Um, but the kids all knew that they were part of it and that they had a role to play. And so they'd be fighting and screaming, and the dog would be barking, and my phone would ring, and they would all hush immediately. And one of them would get the phone and say, Lynn Bowman Creative Services in their best <laughs> professional voice, because they knew that mattered. And that was part. And so they all, you know, came out of high school more or less knowing the, the business behavior that so many kids now just don't have an opportunity to see or, or participate in until they're done with college. Right. Right. They and learned they learned at a young age. Yes, they did, and they can, and they should, and we, we've we been talking for two hours, <laughs> <laughs> and we could keep going on. Is there anything else you wanted to hit today before we let each other live our lives? No, I just, I just wanted to bring back up the fact that your book is out there, The Brownies Thank for you. Breakfast book. And Thank you so much. I just wanted to touch base with you again. And I think it's yes. so important. And the fact that I read your book, and I I can't push this enough. And people that know me know that I, I don't rage on about a certain book all the time. But when I hit a good one, and this book is a good one, I want everybody, if you haven't picked it up, if you haven't even, buy the Kindle version. It's worth it. It this book is definitely worth it. And we're having fun here. We're we're joking around and everything. 
And I want to tell you, this is how the book reads. This is more than just a cookbook. This isn't you're going to pick it up and go, okay, brownies, page. Da, da. <laughs> it, no, you're going to read this book like it's a novel. <laughs> it's a fun book. <laughs> and, oh, tell us about the, before we, before we cut out, tell us about these videos. Oh, yes. I, um, so it, and I mentioned her in a sort of oblique way in the book. Uh, one of my oldest friends, maybe my oldest friends at this point, because, you know, I'm losing some, but uh, <laughs> Deidre Hall and I go back to, uh, we met, we think we met in 1967. She was a freshly minted model. She, she'd just come to California from from Florida. And I was way over my head at Redken Laboratories as ad manager there. So I hired her as a model and uh, she walked in the door and we just fell madly in love and, you know, have been making trouble ever since so many years now. But and who could have imagined that she the job that she took in 1976 was as Dr. Marlena Evans on Days of Our Lives. And we thought it was a great gig for a month or whatever. It's been how many years? <laughs> I can't even do the math <laughs> since 1976. And I, I think she holds some kind of record for the for the most hours on serial TV or something. I mean, she's outlived, outlasted everybody. And um, so she now has a kid who's diabetic, and she took renewed interest in what I was doing and wanted us to do stuff together. So she just put out a little cooking video on her website, which is... Uh, DeidreHall.com, I think. Um, but I'm sure you could just look her up and, and you'll be somehow directed to her Facebook page, which is a, a public Facebook page. So she put out the first video. She made the brownies. And it's hilarious because the way she measures. I had, I was watching this going, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I think, but they turned out okay. Um, it, 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 all this stuff is easy to make and very forgiving and that's the whole idea because i want you to make it i want everybody to actually do this you know it's not it's not the cooking that you do to impress people with how hard it is it's the cooking you do because you want to eat that's like me i want to eat um so and deidre and i will be doing some more uh cooking shows together in the very near we've got plans for 10 15 days from now to do some videos together and i hope you'll look for those on my website, which is lynnbowman.com, L-Y-N-N-E-B-O-W-M-A-N, and I have a YouTube channel and Instagram. On Instagram, I'm Lynn Parmiter Bowman. Middle name is P-A-R-M-I-T-E-R. -E First name, L-Y-N-N-E. -N -E. uh, but if you just Google Lynn Bowman, most of that stuff will come up and you'll find it. And I hope you will, because I did the book for you. All y'all. Well. All of those addresses are going to be in the show notes for this episode, so don't worry Great, if you didn't get you. them. And thank you so much. You're going to get a chance to see what Lynn actually looks like, and you're going <laughs> 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 to. And boy, will but you be right surprised! Now, I'm, I'm sitting here in my worst ball cap and my jammies. You know that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's being seductive now. <laughs> Ball cap oh, and yeah. jammies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep, that's how we roll at this age. You know? Hey, <laughs> you see how much fun we're having here on the podcast? That's how much fun is in this book, I'm telling you. It, the Thank book, you, Jim. The book is such an easy read, and I'm going to, it's not your typical cookbook. I'm telling you that right now. Anyone that doesn't believe me, well, you believe me up until now, believe me a little bit longer. This book is a fun <laughs> read. This is a fun read. As much fun as it is talking to Lynn on the podcast, that's how much this book is a fun read. Lynn, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate well, you, you coming back. You, you know how happy this makes me, and I hope we can just ca uh, keep it up. Definitely. Periodically, whenever definitely. you want. Let's do this. So well, definitely. Well, you're so going to you're going to be back on. I, I, I hope so. I, I, you know, a month or so without Lynn is like a month without sunshine. Without so, brownies. Without brownies. <laughs> that's right. 
you don't want, you don't want, you don't want a fat man to sin now, do you? Uh, yeah, no. But thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. And thank you. We will talk again very soon. Thank you. All right. Have a good one, Lynn. Enjoy the rest of the summer. And we'll, too. we'll talk again real soon. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you. So what did I tell you? Was that a good conversation or what? Lynn is such a nice person. She's a funny person. She's a warm person. And I want to thank her for coming back on with us. Thank you, Lynn. It was really good. I hope you enjoy the rest of the summer. Hey, I want to thank you for being here. You, the listener. Without you, none of this is possible. I want to let you know, coming up on next week's episode, we have Nicole Kerr. Nicole was actually killed in an automobile accident and came back from the dead. That's right. She was actually dead for 15 minutes and came back from the dead. She's going to tell her story here on An Apple a Day. You do not want to miss this. This is a wild story. And you've heard people say that they're afraid of death. Well, she's going to tell you what actually happened to her. So you don't want to miss that. It's coming up next week on an apple a day. You don't want to miss it. Hey, I want to thank you for being here today. And I want to remind you, things can always be worse. That's right. Right now, there's somebody somewhere wishing that they were in your position So things can always be worse. You've been listening to An Apple a Day. My name is Jimmy Apple. I want to thank Lynn Bowman one more time for being here today. And have a great rest of your day. Talk to you real soon. Thanks for listening to An Apple a Day with Jimmy Apple. Your gateway to a happy, healthy life. Join our community at www.famousapple.com. See you next time.